Så er det igen blevet tid til at byde velkommen til Paps Dinenser, din podcast om brætspil. Din studievært er Christian Bak petersen Velkommen til Anden Sange Paps Dinenser, en podcast om moderne bræt og kortspil, præsenteret i samarbejde med Papskubber, hvor du kan finde nyheder, anmeldelser, artikler og anbefalinger, alt sammen om brætspil. Mit navn er Christian Bak petersen og i dag der skal jeg præsentere en bonusepisode af Paps Dinenser. Den er udgivet som et mikroskopisk plaster på såret oven på nyheden om aflysningen af Spil 2020, som vi snakkede om i sidste episode, øh, og indeholder et par interviews, som Bo og jeg foretog sidste år på Essen. I har tidligere hørt vores snak dernede frem med Elizabeth Wingspan Hargreaves, Will Townsend, Aaron Derrick og en masse fede danske designere og brætspillere. Dengang har vi stødt to små interviews af. Først snakker vi med Hadi Barkat fra svejtiske firma Helvetic, et spændende forlag med en særlig unik grafisk stil, der er danske links, og de har nogle rigtig spændende titler. Herefter bliver det til en snak med den engelske designer, som hedder Ruk Marekal, Marechal måske, som vi lidt tilfældigt brændte på i en af halerne. Han var dernede med sit spil, der hedder Serengeti, A Race for Life, et kortspil for to spillere om økosystemet på den afrikanske savanne. Jeg tror, det var forbi Kickstarter for et år eller to siden, og kom med et par små udvidelser. I vores snak, der fortæller han om spillet, og hvad det kan, og hvordan det fungerer, og det kan måske lyde en lille smule rodet og diffust, men jeg synes alligevel, at en designer som Rook og øh, spillet Serengeti A Race for Life er et super godt eksempel på den type udgiver, man kan møde på Essen, og kun på Essen, hvor han var afsted med det her ene spil og et lille bitte hjørneanstand. Jeg fik i hvert fald lyst til at tjekke spillet ud igen, efter at have hørt ham fortælle om det endnu en gang. Men ellers så håber jeg bare, at I, vi med den her episode kan give lidt essens stemning. Man kan i hvert fald høre masser af halv stemning i baggrunden af begge interviews. Where it isn't, where it's the first day, and tell me a bit about what, how has you your like the, the first hours of this day been? Oh, it's been non-stop already. <laughs> I feel like they opened the the fair at eight. <laughs> this year what happened we've had uh, meetings non-stop no it's it's great I mean already I got here Tuesday we ran like a, a mixer event in a pub right uh, with publishers and media people so somehow maybe next year Essen starts on Monday already <laughs> <laughs> uh, so meeting uh, good friends playing games uh, setting up the booth seeing familiar faces it's really awesome sure. could you start by telling your name and what You are actually who you're so, with, and my name is Hadi Hadi Barkat. I am the founder of uh, Helvetic Publisher from Switzerland, from Switzerland. with uh, yeah distributed worldwide. Exactly. And how many games do you have present here today? We have uh, six new games for Essen. Yeah, that's a lot. It is. Yeah, and otherwise we have yeah maybe 80 published games. Yeah, so we have Four Senses. It's a game we're really excited about. We wanted to publish a game that has a bit of a social fabric. Yeah. And we worked with visually impaired people ah. uh, to, uh, to create a game where we can play together. As uh, So people with impairment have a lot of pleasure playing these games and people uh, without impairment can really feel what it is yeah. to play. Uh, it's a clever uh, tactical game with really nice wooden material where the tactile sense is really, uh, is really important. Play, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It looks beautiful and I'd love to try it out later. Um, you, I think it's fair to say that you're very known for like a superb visual or tactile quality to your games. Could you elaborate on that? I mean, how, how come... Is that just a Swiss thing, or is it you? Yeah, it's it? actually Swiss and Danish. <laughs> Best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my other half is Danish. We, I lived in Denmark, and in Switzerland, we also like a, a more minimal exactly. uh, aesthetic, and we try to bring that into our games. Well, I can tell now we're podcasting here, but it really shows, and I will bring home some pictures for people to. Yeah, to see what we're talking about here. And I think in the gaming world, I mean, it's booming, as you can see, and there needs to be games for everyone. And we're trying to bring people into gaming, even like the people who are not playing and all that. So uh, you need to grab them also with uh, sometimes uncluttered games, simple rules. Yeah. 
Yeah. I've, yeah, we, we said that earlier when we saw the, the game down in the, the exhibition uh, area. Exhibition area. Oh, it's, not, uh, it's not very uh, threatening, it's a bad word, but it's not intimidating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, I can, of course I can play that. Yeah. yeah. Right, and that's... Uh, and the feedback you're getting is that, that people fall in love with the aesthetics, the looks, and that makes them go into the games, or is it like equally mechanics and the gameplay that draws people into your games? Some people start with the looks, yeah. and uh, and some people also start with the mechanics. Bandido is a good a good example. It's a cooperative game, really nice turn-based, and actually hard to win. So <laughs> so uh, gamers like it as a filler game, and uh, yeah, it's having a really good uh, life so far. And pr please give us a, a, a quick overview. You said you have six games. Yeah, the next one is Omerta. It's a new collection we are calling After Dinner Games. Okay. So imagine you have uh, friends at home, you're having a dinner, you push the plates, and then you start playing a game. Okay. So it cannot be a too heavy game because just it's after dinner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's almost like We're a almost falling asleep now. Uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's almost like a conduit for more conversation. We don't want to go home right sure. away. The first one is Omerta. The theme is Prohibition, Chicago, 1930s. Right. Uh, and uh, it's a classic game, but it's the best version of this classic game. Okay. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah, and, uh, and otherwise there is another, uh, yeah, the pocket games. Mm -hmm. So our pocket games is very popular worldwide. And one of the latest title in it is called Misty. And it's amazing how much, how clever it is for this size. It's a game of draft and programming. Yeah. And the feedback we're having just this morning already is, uh, it's just like, oh, wow, the programming side is really surprising. And the draft and all that, the combination. And the author is French. He has published one other game that is very popular, totally different. And uh, we think he, he has a, a touch. That's a thing there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's Volkraft, uh, well, I was I think that was the one we saw down in the exhibition hall, wasn't it? Oh, yes. I think, yeah. I think this one is... Uh, it's another game that is uh, like an UFO, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? So we have no collection for it. We, it's just our enthusiast led us to, has to publish it. So it's a game to help people become more self-confident. Right? It's really something uh, we believe in in our team. I believe in personally. Uh, it's just to help people fulfill their potential because yeah. somebody th during their life told them oh, you're not good at that and then it's, the, it's like an image in their mind and they can't get rid of it and this is a game in one hour of play you, you can unlock something that will take uh, hours of uh, psychotherapy I promise that's a sales pitch right there self-confidence guaranteed self-confidence guaranteed yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean uh, um, it was developed by teachers who okay. help uh, kids. Yeah. Um, and when they came to us, we were like, ah, oh, it's like another game, like maybe totally broken. And then we played the game and it was like, but this is really a game. It's like, uh, it's fun, it's well balanced. And where we kept helping them to improve it even more. Sure. The content is amazing. And you really don't feel how it's progressing. And all of a sudden you're, you're there, you're talking, you're, uh, and the theory behind it is growth mindset and other theories. Right. Um, I am very, really personally interested in it because I love basketball right? and uh, I love the Boston Celtics and the coach there year on year on year Brad Stevens he has like the, an average team and they always over outperform their uh, over potential achieve, yeah. overachieve and it's like how does he manage to do that and so I go on YouTube I listen to an interview and he mentions this theory growth right. mindset I was like, oh, interesting. So I, I buy the book, I read it, and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. I use it to help my team sometimes. Right. And then when they came and we played this game, I knew exactly where what, it was coming yeah, from. It was like, oh, them. yes, this is like, okay, boom. So the, so the immediate question is, is there an English version? There is an English version uh, coming very soon. Okay. And uh, we're uh, showing it to our partners because it, it needs a lot of localization, obviously. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. So we're, it's, it's, we're always looking for like interesting podcast angles on new games. So this, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, but it, it looks like it's like language independent, or is there? It is, it, uh, it's. Uh, I wouldn't say no. There is a lot of uh, text in there. Okay. So the the form and also like the advice it's given you okay. and the questions and all that. Yeah. 
So it's it's not language independent. A very distinct and uh, unique uh, look, I think. Unique look to it, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And you might find a, like a, a better version of yourself in German. <laughs> not likely. <laughs> Who no, I would have known? <laughs> no, I can tell you one thing. The beginning of this year, I, had, I was invited to give a, like a 45-minute interview in the Swiss Embassy in Berlin in German, and my German is terrible. Terrible. I mean, because I, I was born in Algeria, so I didn't never learn German in school. I'm oh, learning sure. it with an iPhone app. <laughs> and, and my colleague said, no, you have to do it. This is our chance. You have to do it. <laughs> and so I used this game to come up with strategies All on right. how to do that. Hmm. And Perfect. it worked. Perfect. Because somebody, when we played this game, recommended a technique for learning the answers. Right. Because, uh, uh, you know, because work is, I mean, you travel, you work, and, and he, uh, she said, oh, you should maybe just write down the answer. And instead of trying to learn it like this by just visualizing it, just write it many, many, many times. Right, right, right. And three, four times writing it, I learned it. And it was like, to me, like a miracle. I discovered something about how I learn in playing this game. That's perfect. And this is just like, yeah, after this we had to publish it. Yeah. <laughs> it gets so much easier to like being an ambassador and selling a game if you really feel like oh, yeah. this really works. Yeah, it does, it does. I think it's, um, and it, it's a feel good situation. So you just, uh, you sit down, you're just, uh, it takes you through easy questions in the beginning, you don't have to be defensive, and then all of a sudden you get into it and boom, it works. You had me, uh, Voller Kraft voraus. And a surfing penguin. <laughs> the surfing penguin, that, that yeah. always helps. Yeah, penguins really help, yeah. <laughs> we had people take photos of the game just because of the penguin. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. We got a thing for... Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big thing in Denmark for penguins. I really? don't know if you're aware uh, of that. No, oh, the, 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 um, like the... Uh, uh, biggest, biggest convention for roping and board games. There you can win, like, golden penguins. Oh, really? So, so there's the Oscar statue of role-playing in Denmark. That's a penguin. Okay. So, <laughs> Mag Magic yeah. Maze, the board This game. is typical great Danish yeah. humor. <laughs> <laughs> Typically. Yeah. Super. Right. Okay. Super. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Would you like to end in uh, Danish? Uh, yeah, tak for spørgsmål. Uh, yeah, jeg taler ikke så godt dansk, men uh, jeg håber næste gang. The next, uh, was I, this is German now. Next gang. Jeg taler bare. Perfekt. Yeah. <laughs> Full kraft frem. Yeah. <laughs> tak. Okay. Tak. So it's it's a two-player game set in the African savanna. Yeah. So the players um, are impersonate researchers learning about animal behaviors. Yeah. So you start the game with five copies of a card called the trail card, which essentially represent your team and allows you to acquire other cards. Okay. All the other cards in the game, so the animals you can see here, uh, represent information about the animals. Right. And essentially, You use this card to go out in the wild, observe animals, allowing you to take those cards, and eventually you'll get them in your hand and you can play for their specific abilities. So it's a deck building mechanic, yeah. but it's a majority game. Okay. If you approach it as a deck builder, you probably will lose. It's about biodiversity. So what you're trying to do is at the end of the game, have a bit of everything, right. but with an emphasis somewhere. So the skill is basically trying to find the sweet, sp the sweet spot where you've made an engine, but you're not losing points. Because right. everything that you acquire from the start of the game, potentially, comparatively to your opponent, represent your points. Yeah. So obviously, if you're just gonna be, just, I'm gonna be the antelope, and bird guy, eagle guy, then you're going to get two points sure. out of 16 possible. Yeah. So that's why I tend to emphasize that it's a majority game with the deck building mechanic um, at its core. So essentially all those cards are two cards into one, two functions into one. The top will represent a specific effect and the bottom represent a specific effect. It's the same with all of the cards. Yeah. When you have a sun depicted to the left of the effect, that means you have to power it up with some energy tools or whatever it is. Okay. And the cards themselves serve as a currency. Ah, right. So if you want to produce this basic effect, you need one sun. You can... So from your end, you need to select another card sure. to place face down underneath as basically the payment for it. So I can see some pretty expensive cards. 
just by looking at those actually the, these don't matter in okay. term in term of acquiring them literally you're taking your binocular right. and you're observing an yeah. animal so with this you can take any card you want so it's you can only, go straight for the elephant. It's only when you have those in your hand that you're going to be choosing the top or the bottom and then sure. paying those. But if you were to lay this guy down, you would have to pay yes, a lot yes, of energy. Yes. Sure. But just to make sure it's clear that it's not when you acquire those cards that those suns matter. It's when you want to apply the effect. So, what are you trying to do in the, in the game? Essentially, for all these species of, uh, of research, of all these uh, animals, you're trying to get more cars than your opponent essentially yeah ideally just one more because it's one point per animal so if you over invest somewhere that's what i was saying you're only making one point still if you've got like there's nine nine animal even if you got all nine you're and still going to get the, the one point the tugging mechanism where yes. you're pulling each other yes okay so you're trying to essentially vie for control of all these species of research the lion is a bit of a specific one because you can either, well, actually, I'm going to go with the expensive investment. If you invest four cards, four suns, you can lay in the savannah. It's an open majority for three points. So at the end okay. of the game, whoever controls this has more card than the opponent sure. will earn three points. So it's one point for each animal, including the, the lion in the deck, yeah. but he's also worth three points separately. Right. Okay? Now, this is also a part of the scoring, it's in-game scoring. So you can use this guy, instead of spending four, you spend two, and essentially that represents the animal feeding himself. Mm -hmm. So, he gets a benefit, the nutrient, and so you move that track in your favor. However, eh, he's a lion, so of course he's going to be generating a carcass. So you have to take a carcass. Right. The carcass, it's not too bad during the game, but if you have more than your opponent, again, everything is relative one to the other. If you got more than your opponent at the end of the game, then you lose two points. So that means that the first time you do this action, you're not actually making a point, you're losing a point. Right. You're making one minus two, yeah. if the game stopped at that point. Yeah. So the idea is that you turn it around, and, well, you basically just want to avoid having more carcasses than your opponent at the end of the game. But you can expel them from your deck with the Aina, with one sun in support. Remove can... one carcass. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Okay. From anywhere, deck, discard. If you've got it, you can expel it. And what, are... what made you set this uh, mechanically game in the Serengeti? I mean, why, um, why, why wild animals? Uh, it sounds like this could have been anything. Because, uh, because, well, each of those animals have got very specific things. So. Thematically, it's actually really well integrated, yeah. but I'm me mechanic first and thematic second. That said, the reason why I chose the team is because I'm a bit of an activist. So it's about yeah. animal protection. Raising about, the awareness. Yeah, okay. yeah, yes, so it's very unique on the market as such because although I don't push it that what, that much, there's a message behind it. Okay. I have some expansions, um, but I've got two already out, but I've got another one which I'm working on. But this is about the great migration. Sure. So I'm trying to sort of give the people the experience of that. So there's, there's, there's a zebra, which is going to migrate with the, the wildebeest, but there's also a crocodile, yeah. which wastes in the darkness, sure. and is going to try to have a feast. But I have one in the future, including rhinoceros and hippopotamus, which is about poaching. Yeah. So that one is going to be a bit more Obvious that sure, I'm a bit kind nose. of trying yeah, to yeah. trying to make people aware of certain you right. know aspect of wildlife. Right, right, right. So so that's the idea. Um, and yeah, so you have different ways to manipulate the game. Um, I think once you 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 play, you realize that how intuitive the effect works in relation to the animal. So for right. example, the draw card will be the antelope, so you're going to be thinking sweet. Yeah, yeah, and, and it makes sense to everybody that the lion leaves carcasses. Yes. In all of those stacks, I haven't actually introduced that, but this is there's a rock. Uh, mm. So they're not all the same, and the rock will have actually two effects on the game. It will time the game, so you either play a number of seasons equal to the to this deck, the yeah. deck, which represent uh, weather effects. So it's either drought, Drought meaning that that animal will be away from yeah. the biotop, so you cannot observe it, you cannot take a new card, right. basically. Those red cards 
represent hot and humid, and it's an infestation of scorpions. So they invade the bunkers. Right. So it's a bit of a threat management. You're trying to go and study animals, or you don't want your staff uh, getting stung, no, no. getting sick, not working, blah, blah, blah. Sure. So that's the idea. Um, and the other, the other aspect of this, um, this rock is that once it's at the top, that basic car that allows you to observe animal is not good enough mm. to get underneath the rock. You can still get cars from under the rock, but you have either to spend an extra purple car yeah. by using the, yeah. the bottom part. It basically allows you to switch around the order of the rock and, sure. and the yeah. animal before, below it. So with this, that would be, that's the regular tracking. That's a, a tracking underneath a, a, a rock. Intensive tracking, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, but now, the lizard, as you would expect, is kind of the rock guy. It will allow you, instead of having to spend those three cards, to do it by itself. Okay. So there's always ways, basically, to do things more efficiently. That's, again, very thematic. There's yeah. loads of things where you don't expand, you can't afford in the wild to expand energy just because you can, right. because you can't. No. Yeah. So everything is about kind of trying to optimize every move. And it's a very short game. It's a maximum of 12 turns. Yeah. Uh, that means that every, you maybe get, you're going to getting you're getting bit, between 25 and 30 actions during a full game. Yeah. So if you can squeeze one here and there and that get 10% more actions big, big than your difference. opponent, then that's basically what wins the game. The other thing that's kind of important in this game is that you have to pay attention to what your opponent does. Sure. Especially at the end of the game, when your cards are not going to be used for whatever they do, they're going to be used to tally up compared to your opponent how many yeah. you have. So it's important to watch from the beginning, and that's the skill. Yeah, yeah. And the first game is very difficult. Yeah. But you kind of need to know where your opponent is at on this research. Sure. So you know that on the last turn, if you get this rather than that, it's it, because it will it's mean make the a difference. Point, yeah. Or cancel a point or whatever. Yeah. The other thing which is important is that, well, it's a very small deck. I mean, so that means that I wouldn't say you can't count, but. You always know what you have in your hand, and you should really know 95% what, what your next hand is going to be. Yeah. So it's a very interesting game, I think, because it's very casual. You can sit people that, and they don't think too much about it. They may feel they won or they lost. They don't really, they're not really sure. But if they play again, yeah. they should know why they lost or yeah, why yeah, they won. At least. And they should be able to improve and won. Sure. Win, unless they don't want to win. <laughs> uh, ooh, who doesn't want to win? Great. That's the idea. Yeah. So there we go. Well, congratulations. And, and it's out already or? Yes, yeah. it, is, it is on the market. So it is uh, distributed now in Germany by uh, Tavern Ludica Games. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and the expansions are coming in, are being translated as we speak. So they should be okay. uh, available in German uh, early next year, I think. Right. Very good, well, art, very good art and very clear iconography, I think. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Cool. Paris. Cool. Thank you very much. We'll yeah, I've one. been I've been demoing this game for three years now. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So uh, and doing yeah, these no. pitches, so you know what you need to play so and yeah. what you need to say. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time. And and please be in touch. Yeah. Tak til Rook og tak til Hardy og så kan jeg først fortælle, at vi stadig har et enkelt scoop i optageren fra Essen sidste år, som I ikke har hørt endnu. Og det kommer som del af en dobbelt episode hen over sommeren. Det vil jeg virkelig fingre for. Find links til uh, Helvetik og Serengeti på papsnenser.dk eller papskov.dk-podcast. Husk, at du kan støtte papsnenser på tier.dk med en tier eller et andet beløb per episode. Så er du med i lodtrækning næste gang, vi udvælger en lytter, der kan bestemme indholdet af en bonusepisode, som er gratis for alle. Den episode er for også en bonusepisode, det vil sige, at den bliver ikke chartet til vores tierstøttere. Du kan finde papstanser på iTunes, Spotify, YouTube og flere andre steder. Og så skal jeg jo minde om, at Bastard Café, som vi var afsted med sidste år, og tusind tak for det igen, allerede har lined op, så man kan melde sig til med at komme til Essen med Bastard Tours i 2021. Det er der også et link til på hjemmesiden. Bag mikrofonerne i dag var Bro Jørgensen og undertegnet. Papstanser er produceret af selv samme Bro Jørgensen og Christian Beckmann. Mit navn er Christian Mark Petersen, og på vegne af Papsnenser håber jeg ikke, at essen bliver alt for store. Vi skal jo bare tilbage. 